the barn. Part two. I awoke hours later to my wife shaking me. Daylight streamed around the blackout blinds of the motel. The room clock read 8.10 a.m. I was dead tired. I could barely move a muscle or lift my eyelids. It felt like a giant weight held my body down and I wanted nothing more than the oblivion of sleep. But something on Sarah's face caused me to open my eyes. The three of us had snuggled up on a California king, clutching each other, my wife and I shaking with fear. No idea if whatever had happened in the house would follow us to the motel. Now Sarah pointed to the front door. Fiona stood, scratching the door with her left index finger, a blank look in her eyes. Sarah started weeping again and leaned close to me. She whispered in my ear, That's not my daughter. I looked at her inquisitively. That's not my daughter. She repeated more emphatically, pressing my hand. No, I whispered back. We're going to get her back. She just has to recover from whatever happened. I promise we'll get her back. I kissed her hard on the mouth, and suddenly an idea struck me. A few hours later, Sarah brought Fiona to a nearby park. I sipped coffee in a Starbucks and called the former occupant of our house, the lady who had screwed over my father, Christine Tharler. We had settled out of court, and she still owed a large portion of the rent that was due to my father. She didn't answer her phone on the first go-round, and I rang again. She picked up on the fourth ring. What do you want? She said coldly. I hesitated and offered my apologies. We hadn't talked since I saw her at the house, and most of our contact had been through lawyers. I cut straight to the chase. Well, I uh, know this is strange, but I, I just wanted to know if you, or the person you let stay in the barn, ever experienced anything, well, um, unusual on the property. She was silent for some time. Hello? I said. Oh, she seemed surprised. Her voice was suddenly adamant. We can't talk right now. Did you happen to find a strange box? She asked. Well, I, I uh, uh, yes, I replied. Shit, that's... Okay, the key is buried under the orange tree facing the barn. You didn't force it open, did you? Don't force open the box. These phrases seemed gibberish to me, and I reached for something to say. What? I dumbly replied, The box, don't force it open. I could hear a you idiot implied after this statement. You didn't, did you? Oh, uh, no, 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 I, I, I didn't. How, how did you, how did, good. Open it with the key under the orange tree. She sighed heavily, and I thought I detected a quiver in her voice as if she were crying. I have to go right now, she said. I'll talk to you later. And she hung up. I had forgotten about that box I found in the crawl space. It must still be sitting in the backyard. The thought of going back to that house pained me greatly, and I saw flashes of an upside-down shadow man in my mind's eye. Shuddering, I stood and made my way to Sarah and Fiona. I told Sarah to stay near the motel and that I was going to gather a few of our things from the house and bring them back. We hugged and Sarah told me she loved me and asked me to be careful. As I approached the house, the pit of my stomach tightened and I found myself short of breath. Placing the car in park, I sat in front of the property gathering myself. It seemed to gaze at me coldly without any emotion. Just a simple, dull stare. I was happy it was daytime, and the afternoon sun beat down on the concrete sidewalks. 
An unusually hot December day, even for L.A. There was no sign of a disturbance on the roof, though I would eventually have to go up there and make sure. The interior of the house, however, had remained chaotic and out of order. I almost felt a sense of vindication as I crossed the door and saw the furniture strewn about the living room. We had not imagined it, nor had we had some kind of shared delusion. A rotting odor greeted me as well, and I remembered that a chair had propped open the refrigerator. Our dairy products had probably gone bad. Making my way through the kitchen, with its odd, neat piles of our dishes and silverware, I pushed the back door open and stepped into the backyard. There, in almost the exact center of the yard, was the box. I quickly opened the door and ran in and out of the barn to grab a shovel, yearning to spend as little time as possible in the building. I thought of using the shovel to open the box, but I remembered Christine's tone in regards to forcing it open. Normally, I would not have believed any kind of mumbo-jumbo about stupid mysterious boxes or cryptic keys buried in backyards, but nothing that had occurred so far had been normal. I located the orange tree, one of the three fruit trees in the backyard, including a lemon tree and a grapefruit tree. The land had been a citrus grove when the house was built. In fact, citrus groves had stretched for miles and miles in this area of Hollywood. I thought of Jake in Chinatown. Sure enough, after only 15 minutes of digging around in the hot sun, I found a small metallic box that fit into the palm of my hand. I wiped my brow and flipped it open. There sat an innocuous little metal key. There seemed to be nothing special about it. I heard the distant cry of a crow. I approached the box with trepidation and knelt to pick it up. The lock didn't look like anything special, and I wondered why Christine went through such trouble to hide a box and a little key. I unceremoniously opened the box and gazed down into its contents. A blast of cool, earthy air met me as I looked down, which was odd because the box had been sitting in the sun for most of the day. Inside were five large stacks of yellow note cards held together with rubber bands. I recognized them immediately as my father's, and his handwriting on them confirmed my suspicions. Additionally, something jangled underneath them, and I fished out a silver pendant from beneath the stacks of cards. It glinted in the sunlight and was cold to the touch. On its silver chain hung an upside-down cross. Now, I wasn't into religion or anything like that, but in the back of my mind I remembered a world religions course I took in undergrad and seemed to remember something about this being related to St. Peter not wanting to be crucified in the same manner as his boss out of respect or something. Or it was a symbol of modern Satanism. Either way, it unnerved me, and I unconsciously looked up at the barn window on the second floor. Suddenly wanting to leave, I quickly closed the box, grabbed a few items from the house, and left without so much as a glance back at the barn. I raced back to the Starbucks near our motel and opened the box to read the cards. My Dan's handwriting had been meticulous, and he loved fancy pens and things like that. His script was a tasteful mixture of cursive and print letters, and always seemed to belong in some kind of renaissance enlightened text, not plain yellow note cards. I was very familiar with his handwriting, and though we had used sign language to communicate, we also wrote many notes to one another. The first stack was a conversation between my dad and, I guessed, Christine Tharler. Her handwriting was below his phrases. I started with the first stack on the left, which seemed to be the oldest, for the cards were far more worn than the others. I began at the top. Christine's handwriting was cluttered and blocky, and she frequently crossed things off and scratched them out with force. 
The first few cards seemed benign enough. They were friendly hellos and obligatory, how is your family kind of stuff. A couple of things about a broken air conditioner and the like. And one odd thing about some sort of emergency group meeting. With who or about what, I had no idea. But soon I began to notice a tonal shift in the cards. It's not too bad, my father had written, but perhaps we are being a little naughty. I'm not a bad girl by nature, just by habit, she had responded. But there are things I've wanted to do for a while. My eyes widened. The sexy talk went on like that until it was quite obvious that they were sleeping together. I skipped the next few cards until I read, Oh my God, I'm so sorry about Jeannie, my mom. At this, I froze and let the writing blur over. He had been seeing Christine Tharler while my mom was alive. Although the time from her diagnosis to death was swift, my mother had died in a mix of extreme agony and a drugged-up stupor from her cancer. And my father had been gallivanting around with someone else? Tears began to form in my eyes as I read on. Never mind, he had written, then the phrase. What have you done? I was confused by this, to say the least. I didn't mean... She started to write and then scratched something out and wrote, To hurt you, or her, I'm sorry. I love you. With that, I slammed the box shut and placed my head in my hands. Tears began to sting my eyes and my chest tightened. I didn't want to be seen crying in a Starbucks, so I picked up the box and hurried out of there. I received a call from my wife. Hey! She's getting better, my wife almost seemed to shout with joy over the phone. This park time really did her some good. Can you meet us back at the motel? She paused. Aren't you forgetting something? Uh, I replied dumbly. I prayed it wasn't our anniversary. Her doctor's appointment. We went. Oh! Oh, oh, God, yeah, yes, 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 how, how, how did it go? I stammered. How could I have been so stupid? There's nothing physically wrong with her at all. The doc suggested a child psychologist, but the next we can get her in is ten days. Ugh, I blurted. Ugh is right, she responded. We'll have to hang tight. Meet me at the motel? Maybe we can get out of here tomorrow and find something better. I consented, although she detected something was amiss in my tone. I told her we would talk later. That night, Fiona lay asleep in the bed we were all sharing in the motel. She had indeed improved a bit and seemed a little closer to her old self. I whispered to Sarah about the box and its contents. Gazing up at the stucco ceiling, she held me tightly, pressing her face into my shoulder. I began to cry, and she began to cry, the stress of the last few weeks bubbling to the surface and spilling out. We fell asleep in this manner, clutching one another. It was nice. I had a dream that night. I normally don't remember my dreams, but I remember this one in detail. I was in a citrus grove on a chilly night. Trees seemed to stretch out for miles around me in neat rows, the sweet tangy smell of citrus stinging my nose. A brilliant full moon lit the night sky, and I could smell a distant fire on the crisp air. For a time I walked aimlessly. Every direction looked exactly the same, and I seemed to make no progress. I could have been walking in circles for all I knew. The moon gave the landscape a pallid, sparse quality despite the amount of lush trees surrounding me. 
Overhead I heard the distant sound of a crow, and could make out its tiny silhouette in the distance perched on a tree. It cawed incessantly. Finally, after what could have been minutes or hours, I saw a small light ahead through the trees. It seemed to be some kind of bonfire. I looked back and the crow was gone. As I got closer to the warm glow of the fire, I heard a distant sound, like a low humming noise. I found that the humming was an odd kind of singing. It was faint and low at first, but it began to build as I approached the fire. The voices built on each other, stacking in odd harmonies. Each step I took seemed to add a new voice, and soon I found it almost deafening. The singing reminded me of Ligeti's music in Space Odyssey 2001, clashing sopranos and mysterious harmonies all crescendoing together to create an eerie blanket of sound. I could not turn back from the stupefying music. It seemed to draw me towards the fire. The trees opened to a large clearing, and I started to make out figures moving around the flames. The figures drew long shadows on the earth. Once again, I felt the urge to move toward the fire, though I was beginning to feel fear. It was as if I was watching my body move without any say in what it did, a prisoner in my own dream flesh. The figures gained a little more clarity as I got closer, and I saw that they were moving around the fire at a rapid pace, faster than any person could move. I felt a chill from my feet to the top of my head as I paced forward, unable to stop myself. The figures were moving at a frantic speed, and at about 50 feet from the fire I could see why. A large, round, wooden pole protruded from the massive campfire, maybe fifteen feet in the air. From the top of the pole jutted twelve long wooden spokes. Attached to each end of the spoke was a rope. Dangling from each rope was an upside-down human body wrapped in a sack. The bodies were bound at the feet, and their hands dangled freely. The pole spun, and the bodies circled around the flames like a carousel from hell. As I got closer, I could see that the bodies were spasming. They were still alive, and the singing seemed to emanate from their mouths. Trying in vain to stop my body from going any closer, I began to make out faces on the upside-down figures. They were men and women of all ethnicities. Most of them looked as if they had been mutilated. Some had a missing eye or scars that ran down their cheeks onto their necks. Some of the wounds looked fresh. One of them vomited as the pole turned, but seemed unfazed and continued the maddening singing. The fire at the base of the pole began to climb the wooden structure, and before I knew it, the fire was working its way across the spokes, down the ropes, and onto the figures. The singing became screaming as they writhed in agony on their ropes. I could feel the heat emanating off the now alight structure. I stood no more than ten feet away. After an eternity, the screaming stopped, their bodies going limp, but the axis point kept turning, continuing to swing them in a circle. Unable to halt my progress, I kept walking until I stood very close to the large fire in the center. I could feel its heat begin to singe the hairs on my body. The charred, lifeless faces of the figures seemed to gaze at me as the carousel or whatever it was came to a stop. By now I was beyond terror, and had entered a state of complete numb acceptance. 
time seemed to pass as I stood near the central fire. I waited for something to happen. I may have been there for hours or minutes. Finally, one of the figure's arms moved. Its now charred and skeletal hand raised up and pointed to the center of the flames. Soon more arms began to point until all twelve figures pointed to the central hearth. I placidly turned and stepped toward the blaze. That crow from earlier started up again, but its sound was so faint I hardly noticed. My mind fought for me to turn back, but there was nothing I could do. I stepped into the flames, and fiery pain began to eat at my legs and waist. I have never felt a pain like that before, and though it was a dream, I felt every moment of being burned alive, even as the flames licked the top of my head and my vocal cords could no longer scream. Soon the world was plunged into darkness, and I was falling. The pain was instantly gone, and I could feel a rushing sensation as I fell in an endlessly black void. Soon, a pinhole of light opened before me in the distance. I found that if I focused on it, I could move towards it. The pinhole became larger and larger until I was looking at what seemed to be a, a window. No, not a window. A mirror. In the mirror I saw a pale fluorescent light fixture, the back of a sink, and myself standing and looking at the mirror with a glazed look, wearing the clothing I had gone to sleep in, except it was all upside down. The me in the mirror seemed to be standing on the ceiling, or maybe I was upside down. I gazed up and saw that my feet were indeed bound tight with a heavy chain. Panicking, I began to try and sit up to untie them, but I just spasmed and swayed like a pendulum. It was then that I saw the me in the mirror begin to stir. He had a glazed look in his eyes as if he, I, was asleep, and he made no movement. I desperately tried to wake him up. Perhaps, if I could, the nightmare would end. I began to yell, wake up, as loud as I could, but I found my mouth was unable to form words, and I merely let out a shrill scream. Suddenly, I found myself standing in the hotel bathroom. I was unsure as to how I got there. I looked down to see that I was still wearing the clothes I had worn the previous day. Right, m my wife and I had fallen asleep without getting ready for bed. When I looked up into the mirror that stood the length of the wall, I did not see a reflection of the bathroom. It was entirely black, but in the center I could see a dark figure hanging upside down. It wore some kind of sack, and its flesh was burnt. The black, hollow face, almost a skull, swung in front of me, and I noticed bits of burnt flesh in minute detail, the charred hair hanging from its head. Its mouth was open as if it were screaming, and I began to hear the far-off echo of a ghastly moan. The sound got louder and louder, and it took me a full 30 seconds to realize that the scream was emanating from my own mouth. At that point, my wife burst into the room, and I collapsed onto the floor, head in hands, sobbing uncontrollably. She held me and asked me what was wrong, gently shushing me as if I were a small child. I gladly accepted her comfort and pointed to the mirror. It's just a mirror. There's nothing there, she said in a soothing tone. You must have been dreaming. I tentatively gazed up and saw that she was right. 
The mirror had returned to normal and reflected only the floral pattern of the shower curtain and the rest of the unremarkable bathroom. I continued sobbing into her shoulder, smelling her hair and thanking God I had married her. There was a slight shuffling noise from the adjoining bedroom, and soon Fiona's tiny frame entered the doorway. She regarded me coolly, and we both turned to her and reached out to let her into our embrace, a family hug. Fiona stepped back and widened her eyes. "'Bye-bye, Daddy,' she said and pointed at me as if it were a command. She repeated the phrase, this time louder. "'Bye-bye, Daddy,' and soon she was repeating those words and pointing at me, working herself into a full-on screaming tantrum. She screamed and screamed, repeating those same words, "'Bye-bye, Daddy, bye-bye, Daddy,' She screamed so loud that management came knocking on our door to find out what was going on, what with all our yelling at this time of night. We told the manager that our daughter was ill, and that seemed to placate him. After a while, Fiona cried herself to sleep, and I lay on the bed, sweating, head aching, the images of the dream still rattling around in my mind. I turned them over and over, seeing the burnt faces, the endless grove, the figure in the mirror. It all seemed so real. I turned to look at the motel room clock, 3.10 a.m. Through the window, I could hear a distant crow. The next day, I awoke to my cell ringing around 8 a.m. Sarah and Fiona were not in the room. They must have gone for breakfast and let me sleep in. I was grateful. It was Christine Tharler. I declined her call and rolled over to meet the oblivion of sleep. She called again, and I was about to hang up when I made a split-second decision and answered the phone. Hello. I said, trying to sound as awake as possible. Sorry to wake you, she replied. Damn. Did you read the cards? Yes, well, uh, just the first stack, the oldest. Oh, she said and paused. We need to meet. I was suddenly livid. Well, I don't know who you think you are telling me what I should and shouldn't do after all the shit you've pulled. You have some nerve calling me and asking me for anything. Forget about the money, which you still owe me, by the way. How about a goddamn apology for fucking up my family? I continued on in this manner for some time until I ran out of steam. When I finished, I gripped the phone tight and took large gulps of air. I could hear her breathing on the other end of the phone. I, I, I'm, I was about to sputter out an apology when she stopped me. No, you're right. More right than you know. I deserve it. But right now, I need you to put your feelings about me aside and listen to what I have to say because I'm the only person who can get you out of this mess you are in and believe you me, if you haven't figured it out already, you are in terrible danger, Michael. I counted my breaths to calm down. She was right, I think. Okay, I said after a pause. Good. Let's meet. Somewhere crowded would be best. Grateful, I gave her the address of the Starbucks near the motel and ended the call. I called Sarah and told her what had happened. I'm coming too, she told me in a tone of voice that finalized it. I knew arguing with her would be fruitless. Okay, I responded. 
I was happy she was coming. I was mentally exhausted and could still feel the effects of the dream on my psyche. Even in the morning sunlight, I could see those burning figures in my mind's eye, the flesh melting off their faces. About 45 minutes later, Sarah, Fiona, and I sat in a Starbucks across from Christine Tharler. Fiona was sullenly looking at her hands, not seeming to mind us. Christine looked a lot different than when I had seen her last. Her eyes had sunken into her face, and her once unusual spiky brown hair was now shoulder-length and shock-white. She hunched over as if weights hung from her shoulders. Christine clutched her tea and nervously looked around the room, as if we could be overheard, and finally leveled her gaze at us. I'm glad you all came. This concerns all of you. You're damn right, Sarah said, meeting her look with defiance. Christine sighed and lowered her head. Okay, let's get this out of the way. I had an affair with your father. It's terrible, and I'm sorry. All I can say is he was having serious problems with your mother. During her sickness, we stopped, but I, I loved your father, and he loved me. I'm sorry, but that's the truth. Okay, I replied. She looked expectantly at me to see if I would say more. She continued, We can suss all that out later, if you want to, but we have much more important things to talk about. Sweat had started to form on her brow. I am very limited in what I can say. I swore a binding oath, but I will tell you as much as I can. If the box has allowed itself to be found, well, we are in very serious trouble. I opened my mouth to respond, but promptly closed it. I exchanged a puzzled look with Sarah, and she picked up the conversation. A binding... what? Listen, I don't know what you're going on about, but we have a toddler. We're living in a damn motel room. I'm too terrified to step foot in my own house, and my husband looks like he's just stepped out of the loony bin. We don't have time for this. We have to start looking for apartments. Michael has to get back to work, and I need to get my traumatized child to a behavior specialist. The only reason I'm even entertaining your presence at all is because I just went through the weirdest shit of my life, and I don't have the faintest idea of who to talk to. So speak clearly, speak succinctly, help us out or not, and let us get on with our lives. I almost cried in appreciation of Sarah. I quickly checked my reflection in the window, though. Did I really look like I just stepped out of a loony bin? The face that looked back at me was pale, with sunken eyes, and was slightly slumped over. I had seen better days. Christine looked like she had been hit in the face with cold water, but she slightly chuckled and composed herself. I understand. I really do. Michael... Were you aware of anything your father did that was, uh, out of the ordinary? I shrugged. No, not really. He had another life, and she started to cough. Her face turned red as if she were trying to speak, but couldn't spit out the words. I leaned forward and was about to ask her if she needed water, but she swatted the air with her hand to stop me. She opened and closed her mouth a few times, took a deep breath, and continued speaking. As I said, he made me swear a sacred oath never to tell you anything about his relationship with the... It's holding strong and fast, she thought for a moment. Your father and I were prominent members of a certain group of like-minded people. Her face started to get red again. Why don't you write me a note? I asked. My hand won't even let me write the words, so I'm going to have to try to speak as fast as possible. She seemed to get an idea. Imagine if you could protect your daughter from everything happening to you right now. Would you do anything in your power to stop it from touching her? 
Yes, yes you would. Even if that meant sacrificing your life, you would do that to protect your child, right? Well, yes, I conceded. And so would your dad. We were absolutely certain that we had stopped them. That's when he cast the binding spell on me and the box. He was not happy with me after the death of your mother. She hesitated. Words had been spilling out of her mouth at lightning speed, and I was trying to make sense of them. But it looks like we were wrong, she continued, and now I'm trapped between them and your dad's damn binding spell trying to save your lives, she turned to Sarah. First of all, you need to take your daughter and get out of town. Separate yourself from Michael. It's him they want. He's a direct descendant. They will leave the girl and you alone if they can have him. Michael, she turned to me. I cannot explicitly tell you what to do, but your victory over them lies in the cards in that box. Your dad wrote down all the... <laughs> she sputtered a little and tried to speak, but only wheezing air came out of her mouth. Just look at the cards, she finally said. Okay, so assuming I believe you, who are they? And if they don't want my kid, what the hell did they do to her and why? I said, licking my now dry lips. They will do anything to get what they want, including hurting children. As to what they did, I wish I could tell you. What I do know is that they are ancient and take many forms. Some of us thought they were related to the original inhabitants of Southern California, the Tongva, vengeful spirits from the days of the Spanish missionaries. Some thought they went back even farther and are much more ancient. Whatever the case, they seem to gravitate towards certain areas and attach themselves to certain people and people who get in their way. I personally call them the burned. Some call them the inverted. My blood ran cold at that name. It fit. From the look on your face, I can see that you've met them. Let me tell you, it's worse than you think. They killed us all. Slowly drove some mad, recruited some, or just outright killed others with their earthly agents who are basically people just being tortured into doing things against their will. She looked out the window and her eyebrows lifted in surprise. Her hand unconsciously touched a small pendant on her neck. The inverted cross, an exact replica of the one in the box. She saw me looking. The pendant will offer you a bit of protection. We added it to our crest because the shape counters the... I, I have to go, she said suddenly. Wait, one more question, I said. Who were you renting the barn to? Christine looked nervously toward the window again, sweat beginning to drip down her face. She matted her forehead with the back of her hand. My cousin, Margie. We brought her back there to help us. She... Christine faltered. She was the first to go. Oh, never mind all that. She looked at my wife once again. Get out of town right now. Take the baby and go. She was standing up and starting to move to the door. I stood to intercept her, but she brushed me away. Michael, read his cards. Follow the instructions. She was falling over herself to get out the door. She turned around once more and gave us one last pleading look. Then she vanished into the bright L.A. sun. That was the last time I ever saw or heard from her. A week later, we were moving into an apartment in North Hollywood. It was a crappy, stucco-covered, boxy, large complex, but it was filled with people, and the landlord didn't ask any questions when we wanted a month-to-month -month lease. I still hadn't touched the box, nor had any dreams or incidents. Sarah and I had decided that 
Though we had seen some crazy things, they could possibly be explained, and Christine Tharler was kind of an old kook. I put the box into a closet in our new apartment, determined to put the events behind us. We were still reticent to return to the bungalow house, though we had gone back a couple of times to gather a few more of our essential things. I took off from work on extended sick leave. Fiona was still not recovered and spent most of her time staring into the distance or sullenly looking at her hands. It became harder to get her to eat. We were due to see her new psychologist the next day. It was our second night in the apartment, and we had eaten some Chinese takeout and fell asleep in a pile on a new air mattress. I was in a blissful, dreamless sleep when I was awoken by a low thud in the living room. The apartment was small and only had a few rooms. The back had a small hallway leading to a bathroom and a kitchen attached to the living room. There were a couple of folding chairs and a bean bag in lieu of a couch. Toys were scattered around the living room, not that Fiona had been paying much attention to them. Perhaps the noise was just the sound of a neighbor above or below. I looked at my phone. 3.10 a.m. A chill worked its way up my body. Thousands of tiny pinpricks crawling to the top of my head. I sat up, being careful not to disturb my family, and listened intently. For a while there was no noise, but almost imperceptibly I heard a slight creak come from the other room, then another small creak, as if someone were trying to quietly move through the apartment. Heart pounding, I crept toward the door. Through the window I could hear the distant call of a crow. I placed my ear against the door and listened again. Nothing. I waited for five minutes. Ten minutes. When I was sure I couldn't hear anything, I slowly began to turn the knob on the door and pull it open. The hinges were blessedly silent. Moving with excruciating slowness, I leaned in to look down the small hallway. There was a black shape in the corner of the living room. I strained my eyes to make out what it was, but couldn't see much. I took a few tentative steps into the hallway, and I could hear a slight, strained breathing coming from the lump. I froze and waited. Nothing happened. After a minute or two, though it was hard to hear anything over the pounding of my heart, I took a few more steps until I was in the kitchen, abutting the living room. Crouching behind the countertops, I carefully opened a drawer and pulled out a kitchen knife, using my fingertips to guide me. If the shadow lump heard me, it didn't make any indication. I stayed crouched behind the counter and waited. Now that I was a little closer, I could hear that the breathing was actually muffled crying. Hardly perceptible, but definitely there. I readied myself and mentally counted to three. Using every last ounce of courage I had left, I sprung up and flipped on the lights, knife at the ready. I'm calling the police, I shouted. But the sight that greeted me caused me to stop and backtrack two steps. Heaving, I stared at what lay before me. A woman sat crouched on the floor, hugging her knees into her chest. She was crying softly to herself. She looked to be in her mid-fifties, but her face looked cracked and haggard, giving her the appearance of someone in her eighties. She wore faded, worn jeans and an old black windbreaker. Her scraggly hair looked as if it had been dyed red once long ago, but now ran gray and white down her back and over her knees. Her sharp chin was retracted, and her face had the look of someone who was or had been addicted to meth. On the floor in the front of her lay a revolver. She was barefoot, and her yellowed toenails looked cracked and worn. She made no move toward the gun when I shouted and flipped on the lights. She just sat there, gently rocking herself and softly crying. 
At this point, I noticed the smell of urine and dirt, concrete and hard living. Awakened by the commotion, my wife opened the door of the bedroom and gave a start when she saw the woman. I didn't see Fiona behind her and prayed she was still asleep. Okay, I said as gently as possible. It's time to go. She made no movement nor gave any indication that she had heard me. I raised my phone to dial the police, but the woman suddenly turned to look at me. She had gray eyes and gazed at me as if she were staring through a thick fog. I can't, she said, though it seemed she were talking half to herself or someone I couldn't see. I, I can't do it. Tears ran down her cheeks. When I was younger, kids used to beat me, but none of them knew about me, you know. I had inner wisdom. She were talking as if she were in a dream. Hers or mine, I don't know. I stayed in that damn place. I, I helped. I, I was a good person. She seemed to be jumping through memory and time in her mind. I had a plan that the crow was, was porcelain, fragile, and, and I didn't know. No one knew. She laughed. Sarah stood watching in horror, opening her mouth and closing it. I, I'm not the best, but I'm the most loyal. That's why they, they chose me. All of them. All of them. Both sides. They, they told me where to find you. She looked to me for acknowledgement. I dumbly nodded, moving slightly towards the revolver on the floor in front of her. But, but I touched the wrong fire. At the word fire, she seemed to well up with more tears. Oh, God, she said. It's so hot. Make it stop. Make it stop. I'll do anything. Make it stop. She was yelling now, screaming, and I involuntarily started backing up, though I didn't realize it until my back hit the wall. With that, she leaned forward and picked up the gun in front of her. Wait, 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 I said, putting my hands up. Let's take a breath here. There is no reason to do anything rash. I was cursing myself for not picking up the gun when I had a chance. You got the wrong idea, man. She intoned, suddenly glassy-eyed, as she leveled the gun at me and she seemed to pull even further back into her mental mist. Even though it's his fault, even though he, he did this to us, he really didn't know what he was doing. No one does. She pulled the hammer back on the gun. With that, Sarah came forward and began to open her mouth to plead with her. Shh, the woman said, stepping back and pointing the gun at Sarah now. It's all too loud. I, I have to think. So many voices. I couldn't help but think of the distant voices I had heard in the backyard when all this started. <laughs> you know, man, she said and looked at me, laughing in a low, throaty voice. It would almost be a mercy to do it, almost, if they weren't waiting for us after death. And they are waiting for you and me, but I think I found a way to cheat them, to make the pain stop. She laughed, then she paused and seemed to collect her thoughts. Through the window, I could hear a crow cawing manically into the night. This seemed to bring her out of her fog a bit, and I saw light shine through her eyes, perhaps a shadow of the person she once was. She looked down at her gun and started crying again. She paused for a moment and looked at us. I had a sudden feeling. Margie? I asked. Oh, yeah, 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 M Margie. Yeah, that's me. She said dreamily, as if remembering a distant memory. Then she held up the gun. I thought she was going to shoot me, but... She slowly placed the barrel of the gun on her temple. Whoa, whoa, put, put the gun down. We, we can help you, I cried out. She suddenly seemed fully aware, and her eyes shone brightly in the night. 
I'm sorry, she said, but you can't. Sarah and I begged her to put the gun down, but she shushed us and turned to Sarah. If Margie had seemed foggy and distant before, there was no trace of that woman. In a perfectly cogent voice, she said, Run, run far away. Don't let the bastards get you or the child. As silent tears poured down her face, she seemed to notice something behind me. It's time, she said. With that, she turned around and with surprising speed and agility ran straight for the window. She crashed through the pane of glass and fell two stories. We ran to the window, sure she had broken her legs or killed herself. But we arrived just in time to see her barefoot figure lightly picking itself up and running. She resembled an animal more than a person and moved with unnatural speed. She made it halfway through a next-door parking lot when she turned around and looked at us in the window. She maniacally waved and raised the muzzle of her revolver to her temple. We saw the muzzle flash first, then heard the report of a gun. Her figure slumped to the ground. Sarah yelled. I placed my hands over my mouth. It was then that I looked down and saw a silver pendant snagged on a fragment of glass, an inverted cross on a silver chain. The police took our statements. The event was opened and shut. A crazy crackhead broke into our apartment, threatened to kill us, and took her own life instead. The police had known her as a vagrant, sometimes wandering into traffic or harassing people on the street. Ugh, sad business, really. We watched the coroner take her away. Sarah and I sat on the beanbag chair as the sun rose through the broken window of that crappy apartment building. Somehow Fiona had slept through the entire episode and was just starting to stir. I decided in that moment that it was time for Sarah and Fiona to go stay with Sarah's parents in Sacramento for a while. Sarah protested that we could weather any storm together, but we both knew the truth. We could not place our child in further danger. Sarah eventually nodded and placed her head on mine. It was the right thing to do. We stayed like that for a time feeling each other's warmth. Sometimes I bring myself back to this moment and try to imagine what she felt like, her smell, her touch. The memory fades with time. I drove them straight to LAX. I squeezed them as tight as I could and closed my eyes as if to absorb their very essences. With a last kiss, Sarah and Fiona disappeared into the crowds at the terminal. That was the last time I hugged them. <laughs>